आई स्टार्ट विथ माय केस मॅम समीक्षा धवले अ ट्वेंटी फोर इयर ओल्ड फिमेल जी थ्री ए टू रेसिडेंट ऑफ अमरावती हाउस फाईव्ह बाय ऑक्युपेशन वॉज ऍडमिटेड विथ चीफ कम्प्लेन्स ऑफ पेन इन लोअर बॅक सिन्स वन डे विथ व्हाईट पी व्ही स्टिकी डिस्चार्ज सिन्स टू डेज she had no complaints of pv bleeding pv leaking and she was pursuing fetal movements well a date of her admission was 10 december 2000 uh, 10 december 2023 <clears throat> history of presenting pregnancy her pregnancy was uneventful till now she took two doses of injection tetanus toxoid she is taking iron and calcium tablets regularly <clears throat> obstetric history she is married since 2 year G3 A2. Uh, she had spontaneous abortion of eight weeks in October 22nd. A spontaneous abortion of 12 weeks in March 23. She underwent evacuation at government hospital for the same. This is her third pregnancy. Vaishnavi, yes, what do you expect in history of what specific history you want in history of present pregnancy? Sorry, ma'am, uh, you're not audible. what specific history you want in history of present pregnancy you said it was uneventful so what specific history we want in history of present pregnancy what specific history you want me to present ma'am in present pregnancy what specific in history, history of present pregnancy what hmm. specific history you ask the uh, specific history i will ask this patient hmm. in this present pregnancy yes okay. yeah. Yes, ma'am. I, I'll ask for uh, I'll ask this patient for the pain. If she had uh, any call, like complaints of pain, if she had any discharge, or specifically in this patient, I will ask for history of any preterm, uh, preterm uh, labor or in uh, any spontaneous th- or certain abortion in the previous pregnancy, ma'am. Yes. So in previous pregnancy and this pregnancy also, no? She is how many weeks? At present, thirty weeks. She is, ma'am, thirty weeks. Thirty, thirty, thirty-two weeks, ma'am. Thirty weeks. So, history 32. of threatened abortion in this pregnancy is it important? Uh, uh, ma'am, past history of threatened abortion is important because uh, the main risk factor for preterm labor is previous history of threatened abortion or previous history of preterm birth. So that is why this history is relevant in this case, ma'am. So you are not specifically asked this history. Do you have threaten abortion in this pregnancy? Yes, I have asked, ma'am. I have asked, ma'am. Huh. Oh, okay, okay, go ahead. Huh. Menstrual history. Her uh, last menstrual period was thirty first May two thousand twenty three. Her expected delivery date was sixth of March twenty four. Her gestational age at time of admission was thirty two weeks. Uh, past menstrual history. Her cycles were regular. She used to menstruate for four to five days, twenty eight days cycle. Her flow was average. She had no complaints of clots passing and any dysmenorrhea. So Vaishnavi, mm-hmm. whenever you are taking menstrual history, so the first part should be the history of previous menstrual cycle. They should be LMP and then you did. So that should be the sequence of menstrual history. Oh, ma'am. Vaishnavi. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we are doing a postgraduate case presentation, right? So you yes, are a consultant uh, yourself. Now, yes, uh, since she has two losses in the mm-hmm. past, her this pregnancy. uh when she was registered and what all uh, medications she was on uh, is it relevant yes ma'am uh, so would you like to elaborate on that uh ma'am uh, uh, yes i have mentioned it further in the medical uh, medication medical history ma'am acha no no that this is obstetric history so her history of as madam said history of current pregnancy you mm-hmm. have to mention those things here also ha huh? Okay. 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 <clears throat> uh, patient is vegetarian by uh, vegetarian, and she her bowel and bladder habits are normal. Uh, no sign. She had no significant family history. Uh, medical history and surgical history. She has no history of hypertension, diabetes, TB, asthma, thyroid in the present pregnancy or in the past. She had no known medical condition. Patient is not on any medication at present. She has no past history of any surgery, no past history of blood transfusion, and no drug allergy.
एग्जामिनेशन यस मैम Uh, now would you like to go on with how this pregnancy because you said in the medical history no drugs now yes. no drugs how was she treated in this pregnancy or nothing at all was done two losses uh, ma'am i have mentioned earlier in the history of presenting pregnancy that uh, she is taking iron and calcium tablets regularly acha so, only that much iron calcium and tetanus okay. yes only that much yes ma'am okay, okay. She, and uh, what she, other things are missing vaishnavi what other things are missing in your history in personal history what should be taken personal history ma'am i should ask uh, ask her about her socio economic status uh, if any yes. habits in india it is uncommon but uh, cigarette smoking and all can impact uh, also on preterm labor has it has its own impact on the preterm labor socio economic status will has its own role so this one yes. history is relevant in personal history ma'am what is her occupation is this is it important occupation of the patient Or yes ma'am yes ma'am because high, high if the if mother is if uh, the patient is high stress worker if uh, she is into uh, some labor kind of work or uh, in such cases there is more chances of having a preterm birth i have uh, actually mentioned mentioned while giving the introduction of the case she is housewife by occupation so she may be housewife but she may be working in the uh, farms and all okay so that may be hmm. that is important so history should be complete even if you are knowing the things that should be mentioned in history because each and every point has a importance in your case preterm labor case yes yes this yes, ma'am belongs to you said na socio economic history is important so what kuppu swami modified kuppu swami classification that she belong to because at home also urban housewife also does how much work what is her uh, exertion and all that we have to focus on no yes ma'am yes ma'am acha so <laughs> yes uh shall i move for, for the ma'am <laughs> okay move further <laughs> Yes, uh, examination. Her pulse BP were a uh, pulse BP respiratory rate were in the normal range, ma'am. Uh, she there was no signs of pallor, no edema, no ictus, cyanosis, and lymphadenopathy. Uh, systemic examination. One uh, minute. One minute. One minute. Her weight is fifty five kgs and height is one fifty five centimeters. Could you tell me how much weight gain had? Because this is a very average weight. How much weight gain had she had during pregnancy? Hmm. Average weight gain, ma'am. Uh, no, no, weight her gain. weight gain during pregnancy. Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, her uh, uh, weight before pregnancy was, ma'am, forty nine kg, and Achha. she had six kg okay. total. Okay. Hmm. Uh, no ictus cyanosis and lymphadenopathy uh, systemic examination her cardiovascular system respiratory system and <clears throat> nervous system so, uh, no abnormality were detected in uh, in the uh, above system per abdomen her uterus was corresponding to 30 weeks size uh, she had mild contractions present at the time of admission uh, it was uh, the <clears throat> uh, it was cephalic in presentation and fhs were regular uh, we did ps there was evidence of discharge one minute, should... one minute. is fundal height in centimeters and uh, this relevant yes ma'am normally we don't yeah. take normally nowadays people have forgotten that fundal height in centimeters is to be taken is yes, it relevant sir. and why is it relevant uh ma'am uh, fundal height is uh, relevant in a few case uh, gravi- uh, so yes we have to do maintain gravidogram in patients because ma'am it uh, gives us proper uh, if we can maintain a gravidogram on weekly basis so it will give us a idea if the growth of the fetus is corresponding to the weeks so if the growth is proper is it happening or not if the baby is going to land up into clinical iugr uh, and so we can get over the, get the diagnosis for the same ma'am acha iugr is one thing and especially with uh, respect to preterm labor uh, what mm-hmm. is more relevant higher fundal height why is it relevant in preterm labor ma'am uh, ma'am uh, uh, the fundal height usually increases in uh, ma'am if there is any kind of uh, a retroplacental what yes ma'am i just thinking uh, just give me a minute yes yes Uh, in yes ma'am uh, in polyp polyp po- no sorry sorry ma'am uh, 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 with the help of the fundal height i can get to know whether the patient has polyhydroaminosis yes if afi yes if afi is increased uh, clinically i can diagnose it yes 
other than that ma'am large for okay. if large for gestational age baby large for gestational okay. age okay. is polyhydramnios is likely to have a preterm labor yes ma'am because yes ma'am it uh, the one of the cause for preterm labor is uh, multiple gestation and uh, polyhydramnios uh, because ma'am it exerts a pressure on the cervix where the uterus uh, uterus is over extended in the sides that is why okay she underwent two curettages she did she undergo rapid dilatation or mesoprostol or something because that does it matter whether she underwent uh, dilatation with a set of dilators in and then will it affect the cervix in any which way yes uh, are you talking about uh, ma'am i uh, am i audible this girl yes yes you are audible this girl had two curettages isn't it yes ma'am yes okay. uh, uh, yes ma'am because uh, in cervical insufficiency is one of the cause for preterm labor so in cervical insufficiency if patient is undergoing any kind of procedure like evacuation curettage or lletz a large group excision of transition transformation zone okay uh, okay, if, okay. Hmm. so it can cause patient to go into preterm labor and delivery hence so that is relevant in the cases of preterm okay. labor ma'am okay Okay, ma'am. Uh, yeah. we we did our PS, ma'am, for speculum examination, ma'am. It has evidence of discharge, which was not foul smelling in nature. Uh, we did for vaginal examination. Her os was patulous. It was admitting one finger. It was twenty five percent. If cervix was twenty five percent effaced, ma'am, and vortex was higher. Yes, course in the hospital, uh, ma'am. Uh, patient received injection Maxef IV four gram bolus, then one gram per Before hour. Before that, Vaishnavi, Vaishnavi, what is your diagnosis? Uh, ma'am, this is a <clears throat> preterm. Um, uh, ma'am, uh, this patient got delivered in the hospital, so she her diagnosis is G three A G three A two thirty two weeks threatened preterm. Yes, ma'am. Threatened preterm. Threatened preterm labor. Yes. Okay. So, is this a complete diagnosis? Yes, ma'am. We, wa we want. We want me to mention anything more. Diagnosis. Do we talk about presentation, etc., etc.? Yes, ma'am. I I would like to uh, uh, talk about presentation. She is G three A two thirty two weeks threatened pre uh, cephalic the baby fetus is cephalic in presentation. Threatened preterm single line uterine single intra uterine etc etc. S L I U G बोलते हो ना आप लोग yes ma'am yes single yes so you are done. So hmm. it's a matter yes, of making a habit. Huh? It's okay. Yes, it's it's important because in the exam you will, if you have a habit, you will speak those things. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Huh. Yes, ma'am. Single. Uh, can I go with the diagnosis, ma'am? This is yes. it's a single yes. life intrauterine pregnancy. Uh, okay. She G three A two. A uh, twenty-four year old female, G three A two, thirty-two weeks threatened preterm labor. She has single life intrauterine pregnancy in cephalic presentation. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Course in the hospital, ma'am. Patient received injection Maxef, uh, IV four gram bolus, then one gram per hour for twenty four hours. After that, she received two doses of injection Betanisol intramuscularly, twelve mg, twelve hours apart. However, patient continued to have contractions and went into active labor twenty four hours after admission. <clears throat> Neonatologist was informed on prior basis. An issue bed availability was checked. Radiant warmer, resuscitation tray, suction tube, O2 support was kept ready. Episodic Tommy was given. Preterm FCH was delivered by vortex presentation on twelfth of January twenty four of one point four kg. Baby cried immediately after birth. She was handed over to the neonatologist. There was no evidence of postpartum hemorrhage. Post delivery period was uneventful. Baby is in an ICU at present. Baby did not require any ventilatory support and surfactant. Oral feeds were started for baby from day five of her birth. Mother is discharged from our side and she is now shifted to an ICU. Okay. Could you tell me, patient delivered in twenty after twenty four hours of admission, right? Yes, ma'am. 
acha so obviously that magnesium sulfate uh, you had given hmm uh, how long did your magnesium sulfate last uh ma'am yes uh, in this case uh, once uh, the patient uh, cervix was dilated which did stop uh, so when was cervix dilated in active phase of labor uh, but i know when <laughs> when did it dilate when did she go into active labor she was admitted at one finger dilation acha uh, from what time of admission she acha uh, okay okay so you were monitoring the you or whoever was monitoring the patient yes so in monitoring at some stage somebody realized that magnesium sulfate was ineffective hmm. yeah <laughs> yes ma'am hmm. how long so 1 gram per hour for 24 hours hmm. and magnesium sulfate uh, was not effective so it must have been because when we keep a hand on the abdomen somebody must have realized that some stage magnesium sulfate was not working yes hmm. well, ma'am uh, magnesium sulfate uh, in this case we also gave for neuroprotection that is, that is understood yes 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 but it yes. was neuro protection for uh, if you we give for neuro protection could you tell mm -hmm. me for how long do you give for neuro protection uh ma'am yes for neuro protection we give for uh, 24 hours ma'am acha so mm -hmm. here you were you mean to say that it was given for neuro protection and mm -hmm. uh, there was no need felt of any other um, uh, tocolytic to arrest labor but i'm bo uh, both uh, okay doesn't Ma matter uh, now yeah, what i want to know is actually, basically in this case i do uh, with the thought, thought process of uh, getting both dual effect one is for tocolysis and other for yes. neuro protection keeping that in mind maxer for the initiated ma absolutely uh, so now tell me uh, this, uh, if we are giving metnesol to increase the um lung maturity okay. yes ma'am we like the patient to uh, deliver after how many hours of the last dose uh ma'am ideally patient should be deliver after 48 hours of the last dose at least 24 hours no at least 24 hours yes ma'am so would you have in normal circumstances arrested labor for that uh ma'am with, with the with the perception of that magnesium sulfate will help will prolonging the process we gave Achha. but in this case patient did went into active labor after 24 hours in spite Achha. of giving magnesium sulfate yeah acha acha okay okay theek hai so vaishnavi what are the uh, risk factor in your patient for preterm labor uh ma'am uh, risk for the main and most important risk factor for the preterm labor is a prior history of preterm labor in, in that, your patient what are the risk factor in your patient in uh, my patient uh, ma'am uh, this patient had a previous uh, like uh, cervical uh, uh, evacuation procedure so this was the risk factor for in this case uh, other than that ma'am she had history of two abortions which was first trimester uh, ideally second trimester abortions Uh, are important and relevant for preterm labor uh, she had one one eight week abortion and second 12 week abortion so uh, in this case i will consider even that as a risk factor other than that um, other than that ma'am um, do you think by the way you have um, two of these factors om omitted to tell certain risk factors or absence of risk factors as madam is asking other risk okay. factors You said there was cervical discharge. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Had you taken yes, a cervical swab? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. What had it grown? And what is uh, the relevance? If suppose patient delivers, yes. and yes. you require to, you have taken swab. Abi deliver ho gayi. Abi swab ka kya fayda? What is the, yes. the utility of that swab? uh yes uh, uh, yes ma'am uh, we did take the swab high vaginal swab it was it has infective etiology uh, and then ma'am it is important because we can give the antibiotic pro antibiotic prophylaxis based on the organism found as in cases of preterm labor bacterial vaginosis is uh, a very common common infection uh, so it is important to for the patient in future in future aspect also post delivery to give her the antibiotic cover ma'am acha now tell me uh, that swab report culture report will come after minimum 48 hours right 
Yes, ma'am. Provisional report. Yes, provisional report will come after twenty-four hours. Definitely, hmm. report may come any between twenty-four. I mean, forty-eight to two hours. Hey, what is the utility of that report? What is the utility of that report? Change in uh, change in prophylactic prophylactic antibiotics, ma'am. If we have started so, on any antibiotic and then the patient is showing resistance to the same, uh, and it is not it it is uh, not sensitive to that antibiotic, so we can start with antibiotics which she is sensitive for. It can uh, show a better outcome in case of patient. Patient won't land into raised WBC counts or uh, complications. Now, now patient has delivered. Your patient has delivered. Yes. Right? Yes, ma'am. So what is the significance of that report? New, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, even for neonates, uh, ma'am, the neonate will be with pediatrician, but we can inform the pediatric pediatrician, and then we can uh, tell them about the report, and even they can start line of management based on that report, ma'am. Because whichever organism the maternal uh, genital tract has colonized, which is the commonest organism that maternal genital tract is more worrisome colonizing, and that is at the neonate is at risk. Uh, ma'am, beta streptococcus. Beta streptococcus GBS, ma'am. Okay. Uh, do you uh, believe that uh, in a case of a threatened preterm labor, uh, mm -hmm. one would empirically treat patient for vaginal infection with antibiotic? Uh, yes, ma'am. There are various studies. Treating various the studies. patient prophylactically and empirically without a culture report. Because mm -hmm. the report is going to take time, do we empirically treat patient for uh, vaginal infection? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, ma'am. Patient is uh, yes. Uh, there are there are various studies were done on the based on for this uh, proposition. Uh, so it was concluded in various studies that if we start erythromycin, um, erythromycin as an empirical theory, uh, empir uh, empirical therapy uh, treatment for uh, any patient who has swab is positive, and it can be beneficial for the patient, ma'am. So, in in which preterm patient you will give antibiotic? Uh, ma'am, preterm patient who is having a uh, PROM, PPROM, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, intact membranes, we can think of uh, giving, not compulsorily, but in cases of PPROM, we have to, ma'am. So, only PPROM and if your culture is GBS positive. Only yes. these two are the indications for starting the antibiotic in preterm labor. Otherwise, there are no recommendation to start the antibiotic in preterm labor. Okay, prophylactic antibiotic. Yes, ma'am. So, will you do uh, screening for bacterial vaginosis in every patient? Uh, bacteria, yes, ma'am. For every uh, patient, you, you will do screening? For, for patients of preterm labor, ma'am, yes. So, high risk patient? No? Yes, high risk, high risk patients, yes. So, in high risk patient, you will do screening. And in low risk patient? No, ma'am. Low risk patients. Uh, we can start uh, therapy. So as such, the yeah. So as such, the screening for bacterial vaginosis is not recommended in low risk patients. But mm -hmm. there are no definitive guidelines for high risk patients. Yes, ma'am. Could you tell me which other uh, uh, investigations would point to some risk factor for preterm labor in this patient? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, recently in our countries abroad, fetal fibronectin has gained a lot of importance. No, 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 no. I'm not talking of fibronectin. Forget Sorry, fibronectin. I'm talking of whatever is the routine antenatal profile. Are there yes. any tests which make or which help us categorize patients into, as madam said, low risk, high risk, etc., etc.? Mm, uh, ma'am, uh, uh, we can categorize patient on the. Because I have not. I must have. For, I must not. I must not have registered you telling me. But the antenatal investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes. Uh, I think, ma'am, uh, there is relevance of matter in antenatal profile. There is relevance of uh, CRP and WBC counts in uh, mother. In a routine a a antenatal profile, my dear, CRP and WBC count is where the patient is has come with a problem. Hmm. 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 Sorry, ma'am, I didn't get your question. 
would a patient, uh, mm-hmm. though now her uh, that past history is there, mm-hmm. what are the okay. recommendations, current recommendations about elimination of syphilis? Yes, sir. yes ma'am, yes. Uh, I can go for a cervical length scan, which is now routinely practiced in between 16 to 24 weeks of gestation, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so TVH in, in TVH while doing TVH three factors will give me a clear idea where, whether there is a dilatation of cervix whether there is funneling of cervix uh, uh, and effacement the three factors I'll get to know by TVS and then accordingly I can uh, if the if, if patient is dilated and effacement is good so I can come to know whether the patient is a high risk for preterm labor or not and depending on that I can she is high risk she is going to go into labor which are yes. the patients? No, if at what in which patients will you do? You have normally done it in this patient, uh, ma'am. In pa- patients uh, who is having prior history of uh, again preterm uh, preterm labor, in patients who is uh, having threatened miscarriage in the second trimester, uh, had miscarriage in the second trimester. Uh, in such cases, we should go for TVS, ma'am. Lens okay. cervical lens scan, ma'am. Okay. With two abortions also, you wouldn't do this in this patient. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, this patient had uh, two abortions, but... Uh, uh, they were first the... trimester. She had cervical, rapid cervical dilatation. I do not know what actually yes, happened but... at that time. Yes. But uh, anyway, okay. What about her VDRL report? What about her HIV report? Ma'am, uh, yes, uh, I didn't mention the investigation slides, ma'am. Her investigations were normal. Her HIV, uh, HBS agent, and VDRL profile were negative. Ma'am. What about urine? Urine investigation? A uh, urine uh, urine report was also normal, ma'am. Uh, pus cells, epithelial cells were all into normal range. When were they? So when, please... when was it done? Uh, on date of admission, ma'am. Okay. So, what we are uh, particularly interest, interested in only that uh, urine routine microscope or something else? Urine uh, particularly interested in urine routine microscopy, uh-huh. uh, ma'am. Uh, because uh, yes, uh, with the help of cell count, I can get. Uh, to know so you are having... doing culture sensitivity, na? Yes, urine ma'am. culture sensitivity, huh? Yes, ma'am. So, if the pain she is having is due to UTI or uh, it's a preterm labor, so I can distinguish accordingly also but with the help of your uh, urine routine microscopy and culture sensitivity, ma'am. On history, how do you differentiate between pain of UTI and pain of preterm labor? Yes, ma'am. Uh, pain of preterm uh, labor, ma'am, uh, uh, will be increasing in intensity, gradually increasing in intensity. Uh, it, it will be uh, uh, associated with cervical ripening and effacement. Uh, and gradually progressive in nature. On history, on history. History, hardening, uh, hardening, ma'am. How they uh, contra- ma'am? I will feel contractions. Mm. History, history. Mm. UTI, oh, ma'am. What are the symptoms are there? Uh, in ma'am, uh, this contractions will be associated with relax- relaxation and it, they will be regular in uh, nature. And in, uh, in, in case of UTI, ma'am, the patient will be having pain which is radiating, which is colicky in nature. And it is radiating from groin to groin, ma'am. Uh, and no, uh, UTI's pain radiates from loin to groin? No, not which all. The common, which are the common UTI's? Pylonephritis or ureteric? Pain we are not talking about. There could yes. be ordinary cystitis, no? Yes, burning micturation. Burning uh-huh. micturation. My patient uh-huh. will be complaining of burning micturation. Uh-huh. What is that she complained? Increased what frequency of micturation, ma'am. Acha. Tell Pain me. On the tell me. Side. Now, frequency of micturition. Uh, how will you say this frequency of micturition is a problem? Because as the ba- baby's head comes down. All women mm-hmm. have frequency of micturition. Hmm. So, so by ma'am, uh, doing the routine investigations of URM, I'll get an idea whether it is due to UTI achha. or it is a uh, labor <clears throat> induced pain. Ma'am. Achha. Madam said culture. Tell me how to advise a patient to correct u- collect urine for culture. 
मैम आई विल एडवाइज पेशेंट टू कलेक्ट मिड स्ट्रीम यूरिन बिकॉज मैम एज इट कैन गिव अ फॉल्स पॉजिटिव रिपोर्ट इफ इनिशियल यूरिन इज कलेक्टेड एंड इवन लेटर सो मिड स्ट्रीम इज अ स्पेसिफिक इंडक्शन इंडिकेशन विच आई विल गिव टू माई पेशेंट सो वॉट इज मिड स्ट्रीम क्लीन कैच वॉट इज क्लीन कैच वॉट इज क्लीन कैच किलोज and yes, it immediately after birth and baby did not require surfactant and all that could you tell me problems in a uh, baby with uh, 20, 32 weeks 33 weeks maturity problem okay problem faced by preterm uh, newborns ma'am okay uh, ma'am usually in this uh, age group uh, respiratory distress syndrome intra interventricular hemorrhages necrotizing enterocolitis bronco pulmonary dysplasia our uh, premature retinopathy of prematurity uh, are common things which we see generally in preterm newborns ma'am okay these are these are uh, uh, i didn't say complication these are really complications and these are severe ones ordinary ones are which one respiratory distress uh, ordinary one, ordinary ones that happen to these patients and that's why we have to guide the mother to do some mm-hmm. things so a lot of things have to be told to the mother mother mm-hmm. discharge with the baby home but with a lot of advice so what mm-hmm. is the advice ma'am uh, basically such uh, in such in such patient uh, i'll advise mother to give a proper breastfeeding other than that hypothermia is very common What in preterm proper birth. breastfeeding uh proper methods of breastfeeding like completely covering the nipple in the sitting position uh, held head properly around the areolar region ma'am why why does she have to sit only and give feed sorry ma'am why does Sh- should she always sit and feed the mother baby yes yes ma'am acha Okay. Hmm. Can't she can't and then, ma'am, even hypothermia is very common in preterm birth, uh, preterm yes. units. Yes. Yes. Uh, I will uh, advise mother to keep the baby warm as much as possible, and even during delivery, as soon as baby, I will try to deliver baby in the warm towel, and uh, immediately shift the baby in the warm towel to the. How do you make the towel warm? Auto clip. Auto clip. Auto clip. I'm warmer. Yeah. Uh, this. Hot. Hmm. Warmer. Warmer. Means how do you make warmer. the towel warm? warmer ma'am warmer <laughs> how much should be the temperature of the towel don't feel bad i am temperature uh, ma'am uh, normal body temperature wrapping the baby in a towel is good enough okay. huh? that will help unless yes. your whole ward is air conditioned etc etc but yes, me, what is the recommended method nowadays of keeping the babies warm what is kangaroo mother care could you tell me yes ma'am we immediately as soon as uh, baby kangaroo is mother care yes ma'am uh, we have hand it over to the we keep it keep it on the uh, maternal like body mother's body uh, to give heat provided uh, provide the heat no, to the baby no beta kangaroo mother care is something very specific kangaroo yes. mother care is where the Indus- baby ha uh, ha uh, bolo it, uh yes ma'am skin to skin contact is uh, acha how is that achieved how is skin to skin contact achieved uh ma'am l open uh, yes uh, ma'am i will advise mother to uh, completely uh, to be bare chest and then i will place the baby over the chest and uh, maximum surface of the uh, baby's body should be touching to the maternal skin it will provide heat to the baby and cover the baby from behind ma'am cover the baby from all the sides only the front side which is exposed to the maternal body should be open ma'am what is that kangaroo bag there is a special bag available uh, or ordinary yes, at home ma'am. so they can prepare and who can give this yes ma'am yes this? we can uh, in uh, in rural areas they still ma'am we use only to tie the baby to the bare chest directly in order the both the sides and it is tied to the mother's back ma'am acha who else can give kangaroo care Anyone can, ma'am. Even father, even father can give kangaroo care, ma'am. Yeah. 
So kangaroo care can be given. And what are the advantages? One is you said mm -hmm. temperature maintenance. What yes, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, even bonding, it helps in bonding. Okay. So, where was this practice of kangaroo care started? Do you know? If you don't know, it's all right. Doesn't matter. So, uh, you said uh, proper breastfeeding. One, you said latching and you said the position. What yes. else? What else? So, head support, ma'am, a proper head support, head huh. support. That positioning, lower lip, the same lower. vertical axis as the head, etc., etc. Yes, ma'am, head okay. axis, and I'll say to it that the nipple, uh, the baby's lips, lower lip is completely eroded and it's completely covering the nipple, and I will give support to the head and neck, ma'am. Like a straight. Uh -huh. So, uh, now this preterm baby, how many... Um, how do we know about baby having had adequate feed? She has gone home, na? So yes. Feed is adequate. How will one know? Sorry, ma'am. Can you repeat the question? How will she know she is breastfeeding the baby? Hmm, yes. You know, the baby's feed is adequate for baby. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. We will term it as adequate if baby is uh, not crying, ma'am. The temperature of the baby is normal. Pati uh, baby is not having any signs of... of what all things, Vaishnavi? Uh, cries, ma'am, when uh, baby is hungry or having any uh, ir irritant, fa uh, having any pain complaints in the body. Uh, show the way of expression for the baby is crying, ma'am. Other than that, I will look for hypoglycemia if uh, his, her, uh, the baby's RBA status is normal. It means it is adequate. Baby, baby, she has gone home. RBA is not known to Okay. Hydration, uh, well, hydrate oh. well. Proper. Yes. So how many times should the baby pass urine? Ma'am, uh, urine should be passed daily, uh, daily on the daily basis, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> daily basis, how many, how many times? Ma'am, uh, ma six, six to twelve hours, ma'am. Six to twelve hours. What is that? Oh, so sorry, sorry, ma'am. Uh, six to twelve times, ma'am, a day. Six to twelve times. Yes, a six day. times a day. So that is four, four, four uh, hours, four hours. Uh, what else? What else uh, shows that the baby is adequately nourished? Because when uh, not home, there is no way of knowing. You know, uh, ma'am. Even if uh, normal sclera, there is no signs of hyperbilirubinemia. Will even indicate that baby is properly fed, ma'am. Which babies have got hyperbilirubinemia, and when does that hyperbilirubinemia, which is not uh, pathological, when does it come? Third, mm, third day, ma'am. Third day. Baby was where was the baby on third day? Uh, baby was in NICU, ma'am. Ah, so that hyperbilirubinemia is not the factor that we are worried about now, no? Yes, ma'am. Okay. When does baby lose weight? And when does baby regain the weight? Uh, ma'am, uh, first ten, first initial ten days, initial with seven to ten days, ma'am, baby is losing the weight. Later on, it starts gaining. Weight. Initial, uh, how, when does baby start losing weight? When does it uh, gain, uh, start regaining weight? Mm -hmm. And how much weight is permissible to be lost? Ten, uh, ten percent in first ten days, ma'am, is permissible loss. First ten days. Okay, that's a long time. When was this baby discharged? Uh, ma'am, baby is not dis uh, baby, uh, baby is not discharged. This baby is not discharged. It's in NICU. Oral feeds has been started. Achha, you discharge. Sorry, you discharge the mother. Uh -huh. Yes, mother was discharged and shifted to NICU. Shifted to NICU. Started, why why is the mother? Okay, okay. Well, I got it. I got it. Sorry. Okay. Six okay. to eight ml feeds now, ma'am. Achha, achha. Six All to right. eight. Okay, okay. Okay, so I got confused. I'm very sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Vaishnavi, how will you manage uh, the labor in preterm? Uh, ma'am, uh, management of uh, ma management uh, basically in preterm, ma'am, we first year initiated with tocolysis, uh, tocolytic in agent. Patient, patient is in labor now. Active okay. labor. Active labor. Active. So, how Active will you labor. manage labor? First stage, second stage? Uh, 
Ma'am, in first stage of uh, first stage of labor, I will uh, in so initially I will uh, just I I in preterm in preterm delivery, ma'am. I have to shorten the duration. There, I cannot allow this labor to be prolonged as it can cause effects on the baby as baby's uh, organs are not com uh, completely developed. Fetal lung maturity is not completely achieved. So I will try to try that the labor is not prolonged. For that, uh, uh, that in that case, so I will adequate. I will start. Uh, I give her antibiotics. I'll give her analgesics. I will try to augment the uh, augment the labor uh, with the help of oxytocin. Other than that, ma'am, Vaishnavi, Vaishnavi. If no, ma'am, if patient is not adequately dilated, uh, yes, ma'am. When she is already in labor, why do you want to augment her labor? If uh, ma'am, if uh, uh, I'm saying if the, it is prolonged in the cases where it is prolonged and patient is not adequate, uh, dilation Abhi, is not. If somebody has grown into preterm labor, tell me. Uh -huh. Which labors will get prolonged? Uh, Ma'am, uh, prolonged which labors will get? Mm, in cases of head which is uh, deflexed, ma'am? Mal presentation? It's small, it's small. Oh, so 1.4 kg. Ah. So deflexed head, normally why does deflexed head cause prolonged labor? Tell me. Ma'am, uh, deflex head can cause uh, prolonged labor uh, because, uh, ma'am, descent, descent will not be adequate DPD. And biparietal diameter will not so be. This is a small baby, so biparietal diameter also will be small. By the way, in deflex head, is it biparietal diameter that matters or some other diameter that matters? Oh, occipital frontal, ma'am. Acha. So okay. this is a small baby. So in small baby, what is if, if somebody were to start augmenting, I would be very worried. Why would I be worried? Mm. Ending. Mm. Sorry, ma'am. Hmm. Okay, doesn't matter. So, hmm. I would be worried because first, she's already in labor. Second, mm -hmm. without electronic fetal heart monitoring, if I'm monitoring this labor clinically, then mm -hmm. suppose somebody goes into hypercontractility or hyperstimulation, mm -hmm. term baby will have more serious outcome as compared to a term outcome. Yes, ma'am. That is one thing. Already preterm labor and then I'm augmenting means there is a big chance that there would be, if not precipitate, but a very rapid labor. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is one thing. Now, rapid labor, what problems does it cause to the intraventricular uh, vessel? Uh, it can cause intraventricular uh, hemorrhage, ma'am. Why? Uh, Ma'am, uh, because uh, because uh, lateral uh, intraventricular lateral ventricles uh, had the uh, it had the blood vessels. Uh, no, 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 that I understand. But why will it cause hemorrhage in this baby? Because there will be contraction of uh, the dam. Uh, uh, that always occurs. That always hmm. occurs. That occurs in every baby. Hmm. Hmm. If the contractions are rapid or if she is going through a very strong contractions, the rapid repeated pounding of the head and sudden pounding. decompression will cause the problem. Sudden that is why me. what is the recommendation? People actually it's recommend applying forceps as a protective uh, uh, this also for preterm labors, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. And even, uh, ma'am, uh, in preterm uh, cases, there will be fragile red venous uh, okay. system uh, okay. that can... Okay. Okay. Aid, that can be a uh, aid to it, and even uh, that is why, ma'am, in such cases, uh, uh, due to like sudden decompression, to avoid sudden decompression, we give episiotomy. In this case, also, we took episiotomy for the same reasons. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so, what what you mentioned, analgesia. What analgesia will you give? Uh, ma'am, uh, normally in our college, uh, we follow tra <clears throat> injection tramadol as an analgesic, ma'am. So, what type of analgesic is that? And uh, it's opioid analgesic, ma'am. Okay. 
uh, at what stage should we be doing the last injection, if at all? How many injections would a patient require? What How many the, injections? What is the frequency of giving injection tramadol? Twelve hourly? Six. Four hourly, ma'am. Six hourly. Okay. If I gave it near delivery, full dilatation and all that, would hmm. there be some effect of tramadol on the baby? <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Maybe, ma'am. <laughs> when, uh, when, when will you uh, clamp the cord after delivery of the baby? No, ma'am. Delayed cord clamping will be practiced in this case, ma'am. So, delayed means? After day. how many times? Mm, pulse till the pulsation is pulsation stops. Ma. Pulsation is present. In in which patient you will not do delayed cord clamping? In, uh, in uh, patients which are theropositive, and uh, even in patient in uh, which there is um there is sort of respiratory distress in the fetus. In that case, we will immediately. In the fetus. How does fetus get respiratory distress? Sorry, sorry, ma'am. Uh, for ma'am, uh, I want to. Understood. Understood. Huh? Fetal distress. So the babies which require the urgent resuscitation. resuscitation in that babies you will not do delayed cord clamping. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And in which mothers do you not do delayed cord clamping? Sorry, ma'am. Which maternal problems do you not do delayed cord clamping? Seropositive, ma'am. No, no, that is one thing. Seropositive, you don't do it for baby's sake. But in mother, for mother's sake, in which mothers do you not do delayed cord clamping? In mother's sake, so delayed cord clamping. Mm -hmm. Whenever mother is in a critical condition, na, she, you require to finish your procedure fast, isn't it? So, mm. uh, the position of the mother for delivery mm. is going to matter. So, you require to be cautious about how the maternal health is. Now, actually, we don't have the birthing chairs. Mm. Yes. So, how the mother is breathing, whether the mother has any cardiac problem, this, that, numerous factors which mm. decide whether we will uh, from the maternal aspect, uh, we will do uh, cord, normal cord clamping or early cord clamping. No? In which preterm patient you will go for LACS? In which preterm mother? In preterm in preterm cases, usually LACS is not indicated unless and until there is. Uh, for, for a viable fetus, which is above twenty four weeks, uh, if there is not any fetal indication like fetal distress, ma'am, in such cases we have to go. For LSCS. In Otherwise, which... we will give a general trial. No, no. You hear the question properly. In which preterm babies you will go for cesarean sections? Preterm. Uh... Think about the presentation, everything. Um, mal, mal, mal presentation, yes, ma'am. Mal presentation. Mal presentation, which mal presentation? Breach, breach, ma'am. So, preterm breach, you will do cesarean section. Yes. LSCS, ma'am. And even fetal distress, ma'am, this yes. is the indication for LSCS yes. in preterm. So any obstetric indication, you will go for caesarean section. Otherwise, vaginal delivery. Yes, ma'am. Uh, obstetric indication uh, like antipartum hemorrhages, pre, uh, uh, antipartum hemorrhages, uh, uh, or ma'am, uh, pre -eclam eclampsia, we can go for. Preeclampsia, eclampsia, should you do this is necessarily cesarean? Okay. No, ma'am, we, we can give trial. Achha. So you will decide based upon the merits of the case. In yes, the yes, 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 ma'am. Depending and on so the merits of the up, case. It's already eight. We have to wrap up. Okay. Well, Totally. Then... Which tocolysis you will use? Uh, agent, in this case, we have used a maximum for the agent, but since there are other advantages, and I don't see There is a lot of disturbance from your side, Vaishnavi. Yeah. Um, uh, recent advances, there are a lot of drugs that have under the trial. So, what is the recommended first line of treatment as a tocolysis? Is the first uh, max, max and nipidipin. 
myself and never depend vaishnavi just going to ask you one last question vaishnavi yes sir ask you one question yes sir yes madam madam has already asked you about the tramadol uh, supposing that uh, inherently you are given uh, tramadol even after full dilatation and the baby is going to be delivered but in which case it will be beneficial for the sake of baby can you show the sake of baby ma हाउ इट विल बी बेनिफिशियल टू दॉर द सेक ऑफ बेबी If you give it late in delivery, uh, sir, bearing down effect of um, baby. Um, for the sake of baby. For mother, mother's bearing down will be good, so it will indirectly facilitate the baby's delivery. So, so there will be. Do you do you mean to say rapid delivery is uh, beneficial for the baby? Sorry, sir, your voice is. Uh... Okay, yes, no, no. It is. It is not related to the uh, time of delivery. See, Madam has already uh, told you that uh, the decompression and sudden deco uh, decompression is going to be uh, harmful to the baby. Isn't yes, it? yes. It has sir. to be slow. Yes. Uh, my question is, how tramadol is going to be helpful in case of baby if it is given in uh, late, uh, say after full dilatation? Yes, sir. yes, sir. Because uh, otherwise sorry. it is not beneficial. It is harmful. it will help in expulsion and in second stage of labor sir it will help in expulsion and propulsion uh, otherwise there will be a regression and no, because of look, regression okay i will give you a clue supposing that there is a meconium stain lacquer hmm so will it will it be helpful for the baby if you give tramadol hmm what happens with tramadol think about it <laughs> what do i want to do if there is meconium what do you do as a neonatology uh, resident suctioning suctioning now to tell us tell sir why it is beneficial uh it can be collected fluid in the lung it can help in that manner ma'am so suctioning can uh, no 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 tramadol tramadol you talking about tramadol is it going to be helpful or it is not helpful for the sake of baby helpful okay. helpful sir how 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 we will not aspirate of meconium sir uh, why baby will not aspirate sedation so what happens <laughs> with sedation <laughs> Uh, deep, deep breathing. Deep breathing. Again, our deep, very respiratory depression. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, sir. So, <laughs> so the baby will not have respiration. So no aspirin. Yes. That that will help in preventing the. I'm so sorry, sir. Why I couldn't think in that way? I'm so sorry. Yeah. So, it, it is always forget about forget about the prematurity. any case of meconium stain uh, like uh, if you mm -hmm. have a uh, facility you can sedate the patient and uh, mm -hmm. then you uh, suck out the meconium whatever is there in the uh, throat and then mm -hmm. you start uh, uh, oxygen or on the by mask ventilated mm -hmm. by mask so that mm -hmm. there is no there is no meconium aspiration okay. that is the way in which is how it is treated yes sir So, question will last Sorry, question. Last. If you want to give progesterone for the prophylaxis, which progesterone yes. you will give, and for which patient you will give progesterone? Hydroxy uh, progesterone, so, ma'am. But yeah, in it, it generally, ma'am, it, it just depends upon the cervical length of the patient. If the cervical length is too short, uh, if the cervical length is short, the mainstay of my treatment will be giving progesterone. Short, the, short, short means what is less than twenty-five mg. Yes. So you will give seventeen hydroxy progesterone, 
or any other yes, no, so according to new guidelines 2023 17 hydroxy progesterone is not indicated or not recommended only progesterone which is recommended is vaginal progesterone that's micronized progesterone okay yes, 17 sir, hydroxy sir. progesterone is not recommended at all yes the, yes Prevention yes. of yes, yes, such, such thin capsule in form. How of. long do you give progesterone, Vaishnavi? Uh, ma'am, till the th till th thirty four weeks, ma'am. So we can give till thirty seven weeks also. Okay. Okay. Ma the hmm. recommendation is till thirty seven weeks. You can give okay. progesterone till thirty seven. Hmm. Okay. So I think uh, our time is over, is it? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay, okay. It was a wonderful discussion. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Very Thank nice you so much, ma tips. I think we'll be together. We'll have a one group photo. I think Dr. Surti is also there. Please open up your windows. We'll have a group photo. Yes, yes. Good evening, Dr. Sushma. How are you? So, I caught you. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, we would love to listen you. <laughs> so we'll have one photograph. Please stop yes. sharing first. Please stop sharing first. Yeah, we have stopped, sir. Corona people? Yes, ma'am. It's over? Okay, we can go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Nanku Padmaja, ma'am. Dr. Ganchan. It was a very good for giving us the opportunity to uh, participate in this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Such a great discussion with lots of learning points to remember. I thank our examiner, Dr. Padmaja ma'am, Dr. Kanchan ma'am, and also I thank Dr. Vaishnavi for such an interesting session. Moving to the next session, that is Pearls of Wisdom, for which I would like to welcome our chairpersons. Dr. Adish, Ajit Deshpande sir, he is a renowned consultant, gynecologist, infertility specialist, and laparoscopic surgeon. He has been passed. Uh, he is a director of Mohini Hospital IVF Center, Shirampur Ahmednagar. He has been passed secretary, past vice president, past president of IMA Shirampur. He has been invited as a speaker and faculty in various state and national level conferences. He has multiple publications in national and international journal under his name. I welcome you, sir. Now, I introduce our next chairperson, Dr. Sahili Jahagidhar Ma'am. She's an associate professor at Dr. Punjab Rao Deshmukh Medical Mem Memorial Medical College, Amravati. She has been a se clinical secretary in Amravati OBJY Society, scientific chair chairman in IMA, etc. She has received the late Shailaja Chaudhary Award for Academic Excellence in 2018. She also has multiple uh, publications under her name. I welcome Sahili Ma'am. Thank you. Now, I would like to hand over to our chairperson for further proceedings. Welcome, Dr. Sali and Dr. Ajit Deshpande, sir. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Should I start, ma'am? Should I start?
हेलो डॉक्टर टीना डॉक्टर टीना प्लीज इंट्रोड्यूस अग्रवाल मैम डॉक्टर टीना एम आई ऑडिबल यस यू आर यस यू आर यस आई वुड लाइक टू इंट्रोड्यूस आवर स्पीकर डॉक्टर स्मृति अग्रवाल मैम शी हैज डन एमडी फ्रॉम पीजीआई चंडीगढ़ she is professor and head of the department of obstetrics and gynecology rims lucknow she has been awarded professor dhavendra kumar young investigator gold medal by kgmu lucknow she has received icons of health award by times of india group by honorable health minister she has she is a member of core group to revise emo nc curriculum of moh fw 2019 for she has also formulated guidelines in medical disorders in obstetric and genital tuberculosis for ministry of health goi 2015 she, i uh, she has a special interest in fetal medicine and reproductive medicine she has more than 55 publication in reputed international and national journals i welcome smriti ma'am thank you so much am i audible yes when you are Uh, thank you so much dr krishna it's a pleasure to be connected uh, with nagpur society and thank you so much and giving me this opportunity to interact with your post graduates and i continue to learn from the post graduates and i was just listening to the case discussion also it was wonderful this is a very good effort from nagpur society thank you for having me so today uh, in the next few minutes we will talk about uh, cardio tocography which is a very very common test used by the post graduates of department of obstetrics and i would just like to uh, revise the basic concepts and also introduce an update on it so these are the following things which i would cover in the next few minutes uh, very briefly about the ctg machine dr c bravado approach what are the guidelines which are there because there are three of them which are very uh, commonly used and there is some kind of a disparity in uh, in them the pitfalls and the complex presentations and the advanced ctg techniques so we know that uh, cardio tocography it's a technical uh, method in which we record the fetal heart rate and the uterine contractions the machine we know is called as cardio tocograph and more commonly known as electronic fetal monitor we know that we use this machine both antepartum in order to know the autonomic uh, function of the uh, fetus and we also use it intrapartum to monitor the fetal response in labor uh basically it uses ultrasound to detect the fetal heart rate and um, it uses the principle of doppler effect we all know that so we know that there is a motherboard there is a power cord and there is a 3 in 1 probe which in which uses the ultrasonic probe the contraction probe and the fetal movement pen and we know that the toco probe is attached to the fundus of the uterus with less pressure um the the ultrasonic probe is attached where the fetal heart sounds are heard by auscultation and the fetal movement pen is given to the pregnant woman where she presses each time she ha she experiences a fetal movement so we all know that uh, we use the ctg machine very often and uh, we just i just want to to also add a few things about the maintenance which is needed about the ctg machines remember that you don't really need to use any strong solvents don't use any abrasive material don't use any liquids to clean your ctg machine just wipe it with tissue paper in case it gets dirty then you can use some kind of a sterilium on a tissue and then just wipe it clean don't pour the liquid into the machine uh you can if you want to disinfect you can just wipe the probe with the help of 70% alcohol the sterilium which we use and use dry and soft cloth to wipe the liquid material the coupling agent should always be water based jelly which we use for ultrasounds and not oil based so a lot of times we see in our labor rooms that the women is lying completely supine and the ctg machine is attached to it it is important that to know that it is not an ideal position because there is an auto caval compression by the pregnant uterus which affects the placental perfusion and fetal oxygenation so prolong monitoring if you have to do don't do it in this position because it is bound to show some kind of abnormal features and where you would be over diagnosing the abnormalities of ctg the ideal positions are lateral recumbent 
it can be half sitting or upright position they are definite preferable alternatives there are a lot of portable um, sensors also portable um, fetal monitors which are available and uh, they can transmit the signals to a remote fetal monitor sometimes even to our phones the smartphones and we can continue to monitor the lady uh, in uh, remotely when she is in the labor room now when we talk of ctg we remember that there are two components cardio and toco so we're talking about the fetal heart rate and the uterine contractions uh, the paper runs at a speed of 1 cm 2 cm or 3 cm now there is nothing to suggest which speed is better uh, whatever our eyes are trained for we should use that speed the commonly used speeds are 1 cm per minute or 3 cm per minute uh, so there is completely no uh, reason for you to choose one over the other. You can choose either of the speeds. Uh, basically, we we get used to a particular kind of a pattern. So it is important to stick to one particular paper speed always. Now we know that this is how a CTG paper looks like, where uh, you have boxes and each box has. Now when there are vertical, there are thirty. There's a difference of thirty beats. So each small space or vertical is corresponds to 10 beats. And um, depending upon the paper speed, three centimeter per minute means this is like one centimeter. So three uh, boxes will mean one minute. So that is how, so that means each box will be 20 seconds. So this is an, um, a very um, basic way of understanding how the CTG is interpreted. Now, when we talk about CTG, we will talk about the components of CTG, um, we know that there are four components, the baseline, heart rate, then of course the accelerations, decelerations and variability. Now baseline fetal heart rate is, is uh, the most important um, and it is very important to follow certain very simple rules. Uh, it is remem remember that if you have a CTG like this where there are a lot of accelerations and a lot of variability going on, try to find a part of the CTG where it is most horizontal and least oscillatory. And it should be a period of at least 10 minutes. And then you have to take a mean of it. And then you know that that is the baseline fetal heart rate. So it is important that this baseline is uh, interpreted over a period of 5 to 10 minutes. And it is calculated as a mean level. Normal baseline fetal heart rate is between 110 to 160 beats per minute. A lot of times we talk 120 to 160, but remember it is 110 to 160. Uh, you uh, also encounter many times fetal heart rate for no reason uh, to be between 100 and 120. Remember, you have to take the entire patient as a whole. Don't just read a CTG of 105 beats per minute and start sending alarms that this is abnormal. It can be because of a lot of reasons like post-dated pregnancies, sometimes of women experiencing maternal hypothermia, Sometimes if she's on beta blockers and fetal arrhythmias are also possible causes. But remember that when the heart rate, fetal heart rate goes above 160, it is called as fetal tachycardia. And you have moderate tachycardia, which is 160 to 180 and more than 180 is definitely abnormal. Now, the commonest cause of fetal tachycardia is hypoxia. We know that chorionitis also presents as fetal tachycardia. Hyperthyroidism, especially because the maternal heart rate is increased. Fetal or maternal anemia or fetal tachyarrhythmias. Similarly, fetal heart rate less than 110 is bradycardia. If it is 100 to 109, it is moderate. And if it is less than 100, it is definitely abnormal. And why does it happen? Because of prolonged cord compression, because of cord prolapses, because sometimes epidural and spinal anesthesia can also lead to bradycardia. So uh, that basically happens because of hypovolemia and hypotension. So it is a good idea to put the patient in the left lateral position and then uh, reassess the fetal heart rate. And maternal seizures can also lead to bradycardia. That is why a lot of times what happens in the labor room that if a woman who has come with eclampsia, uh, when she comes, we immediately resuscitate her and we give her magnesium sulfate. Uh, the commonest mistake which we make is immediately we apply the the cardio probe onto the maternal abdomen and then we start uh, panicking that the fetal heart rate is going down. Now we have to wait when the mother gets stabilized only then we should uh, do the CTG otherwise invariably you will find fetal bradycardia soon after a maternal seizure. Now the next most important thing is variability. Now we are our eyes are trained to see if the 
the baseline fetal heart rate is coming as a straight line or there is a zigzag pattern to it. But if anybody asks you, you should be able to count the variability by uh, counting the boxes and seeing what is the uh, variability between, what is the difference between the peak and the trough and that gives you the variability. Uh, this also has to be done in a one minute segment and expressed as beats per minute. Normally it is between five to 25 beats per minute. When the variability is less than five for at least a period of 50 minutes again. So uh, for you to say that a CTG is becoming abnormal, you should have a reduced variability, but that should, that should be for a minimum period of 50 minutes. Or if a woman is having a deceleration, then during deceleration, if she's having loss of variability, that is an ominous. Now, why does this happen? Again, it's a sign of fetal hypoxia. So uh, there is a high degree of subjectivity in this parameter. So it is very important that you reevaluate the CTG. If you have any doubt that whether she has a variability which is significantly um, abnormal or not. Uh, now, the causes of reduced variability are sleeping fetus. Now, we know that a fetus has a sleep-wake cycle. And uh, usually, a fetus is sleeping for at least 40 minutes. So, if you think that you're getting a CTG where the variability is poor, either wait for some time and then stimulate the baby and then repeat the CTG. Or you ask the mother to take a stroll, come back and then repeat the CTG. Most of the times, it will be normal later on. Sometimes fetal acidosis, especially if vari reduced vari variability is associated with deceleration, definitely abnormal. Now, again, a lot of times we give magnesium sulfate. Benzodiazepines are, of course, not used. Methyl dopa is also not used. Opiates are also usually not used anymore. But magnesium sulfate, remember, again, eclampsia is we give magnesium sulfate. And soon after that, we take out a CTG. We either find bradycardia or we find reduce variability. So we have to be careful about that. Just wait for some time. Of course, remember that reduced variability is going to happen with magnesium sulfate. So evaluate the patient as a whole and then take a decision. Similarly, if the fetus is premature, less than 32 weeks, this fetus is bound to have reduced variability. Now, acceleration, we are all very fond and it is something which we all really like, you know, really like accelerations. We know it is um, when the baseline fetal heart rate rises by 15 beats per minute and lasts for at least 15 seconds, then we are happy to say that this is an acceleration. If you get an acceleration, it is good. If you don't get one, please don't be disappointed because it is not, absence is not really of any, un, of any known significance. Now, most of them, uh, they coincide with the fetal movements. And of course, it says that the uh, autonomic nervous system is intact. Uh, if, however, if a woman has a lot of risk factors, medical disorders, then taking a cutoff. And if you have to do a fetal surveillance before 32 weeks, then, of course, the cutoffs are taken as 10 seconds and 10 beats, not 15 seconds and 15 beats. Um, and after 32 to 34 weeks, because that is when the fetal behavioral pattern uh, becomes, uh, it sets up. Then usually accelerations do not occur when a fetus is sleeping which is approximately a 40 to 50 minute cycle. So then you need to repeat it and see if you really want to. Otherwise, loss of acceleration does not really mean anything. Now, next we come to deceleration. Yes, deceleration is something we have to be very careful about. Like how you have acceleration 15 beats and 15 seconds. Similarly, deceleration is also decreasing the fetal heart rate 15 beats below the baseline for minimum 15 seconds. Now, uh, types are usually, there are three types, early, variable, and late. We used to use this terminology, typical and atypical, but now this terminology is not used anymore because now we only classify it as early, variable, and late. I will tell you all the details in a short while. Now, why do we say, uh, of course, you all know, I just want to, uh, you know, just revise it, that we know that when the contraction is happening and the deceleration is Timed with the contraction, the nadir of the deceleration is at the peak of the uterine contraction. So you know that this is an early deceleration. However, if the, the deceleration starts happening once the contraction is ceased, then it becomes a late deceleration. And when deceleration does not have any relation to the uterine contraction, then it becomes a variable deceleration. 
So as you can see in this picture, as the uterine contraction is happening, the fetal heart rate is dipping down. Every, almost every contraction, you can see that the fetal heart rate is dipping down. So these are early decelerations. Early decelerations, again, not something to be too much worried about. They usually happen because of head compression, because the head is being pressed down and there's an increased intracranial pressure. They're completely normal in first stage and um, late first stage and second stage. But obviously, uh, you interpret these decelerations as early only when you attach a tocoprobe also, and you're able to get a graph where the nadir of the, of the fetal heart rate is coinciding with the peak of the uterine contraction. Now, variable deceleration, as I just said, that they don't have any relation. They usually happen because of cord compression. Now, cord compression can happen due to various reasons. Sometimes when the glycer is a little reduced, the cord gets compressed very easily. So again, we have to see a lot of things whenever we are evaluating a case of variable deceleration. Uh, we know that they are variable in duration and they don't have any relationship. They're seen in labor, especially with oligoamnios. Why it's happening is because the umbilical vein is occluded first. <laughs> and this causes a decrease in the venous return and cardiac output, and which leads to an accelerated response. As you can see here, that these decelerations don't have much relation to the uterine contraction. Now, if you have certain components of variable deceleration, then remember these variable decelerations are ominous. And what are they? So what is actually happening is each time the deceleration is happening, uh, it is leading to shouldering. And when we say shouldering, we mean that the fetal heart rate comes to the baseline and then shoots up. This is shouldering. So shouldering should happen normally. But if with variable deceleration, the shouldering is not happening. You see? Here it is going up, going up, going up. It should go up further. But however, if it is not going up, you know that you're losing the shoulder and that is ominous. If suppose, um, like how we saw here, these fetal heart rates are returning very quickly to baseline. Now, this is normal. However, if the return to baseline is small, is, is slow, sorry, then of course, this is an ominous feature again. Now, sometimes what happens is that the baseline fetal heart rate, the fetal heart rate will go down from the baseline deceleration and then it does not really come to the baseline and it continues there. That is also ominous. Second thing is that suppose when the deceleration is happening, the variability is lost. So these are four ominous features of variable decelerations. So remember nowadays, uh, decelerations or variable decelerations are not called as typical or atypical. However, uh, there are just these four features which are of concern during the variable decelerations and we should remember them. Next, we come to late decelerations. Now, late decelerations, characteristically, when the uterine contraction has finished, the fetal heart rate is touching its nadir. So that means the fetal heart rate starts dropping when the contraction is waning off. And when the contraction is not there, that is when the fetal heart rate is at its lowest. So this happens because of fetal hypoxia and reduced blood flow. And this is something to be worried about. Uh, other conditions are maternal hypotension. Sometimes women will be having hypostimulation because of our induction agents, uh, if we are not careful enough. And of course, in FGRs. As we can see here, these are late. You see here, these are the uterine contractions. And this, this is a deceleration. Similarly, here we can see that these are all late decelerations. Here we are able to see that there is variability. But you can see how slowly they are returning to baseline. And this is abnormal. Now, uh, so these are, even if you look at the pictures, no, sometimes you can make out, for example, this is an early deceleration. It is like almost like a V. And this is a late deceleration. This is almost like a U which is abnormal. So when you understand these four components of CTG, a way to remember and write in your case sheets is Dr. C. Bravado. And Dr. C. Bravado is just a mnemonic to remember what are the things you write when you interpret a CTG. DR stands for define the risk. Suppose you have a 30-year-old lady who is second gravida with previous cesarean and hypertension in pregnancy. 
Remember to write the risks as two, previous cesarean and hypertension in pregnancy. Whether she's having contractions, yes or no. What is her baseline fetal heart rate? What is the variability? If accelerations are present or not, if decelerations are present or not, and then overall, what is your interpretation? So this is our Dr. C. Bravado, and I strongly uh, recommend and encourage our postgraduates to use this mnemonic this is a well-established mnemonic which is used in US and is also taught in a lot of emergency obstetrics trainings over there. Um, this is basically to how to interpret the CTG and record in our case sheets. So this is what Dr. C. Bravado is, that you have to write all these things. And then overall, you write your impression whether this is normal, whether this is suspicious and what you're going to do about it. Now, next thing we come to as the guidelines. So now there are three uh, prominent guidelines which talk about interpretation of CTG. NICE came with a 2017 guideline and now we have an amended 22 guideline, which is very similar except for a few changes. FIGO guideline still stands at 2015 and ACOG guidelines 2010. So all the postgraduates must go through these guidelines to get a clear understanding of CTG. Now, the NICE guidelines, they basically classify, categorize the CTG into three, which is reassuring or white, non-reassuring or amber, and abnormal or red. So, it's almost like a signal, the traffic signal, only the light, the colors here are white, yellow, and red. So, white is good, yellow is in between, and red is bad. So, this is again what we ever have just talked. So, you don't need to really memorize all of them because they're all the same. Remember the white and remember the red. The rest, everything is in between yellow. So this becomes easy to remember. Variable decelerations in which up to 50% when they're present in up to 50% contractions, they are amber. And variable decelerations in more than 50% of contractions become red. Now, uh, depending upon whether you have a white, you have an amber or you have a red, you decide what has to be done. Now, suppose if all the features are white, then obviously everything is fine. Just continue her fetal surveillance like usual and continue with the management. Now you say uh, it, the category as suspicious if you have one amber and two white features. Now in this case, maybe there is something going wrong with the patient which you can easily correct. For example, maybe she's having a uterine hypertonus. Maybe she's lying supine and she's having a hypotension. Maybe there is some kind of a cord compression happening because of position. So it's a good idea to do an intrauterine resuscitation. Like what we do is uh, put the patient in left lateral and give her oxygen or, you know, um, maybe just let her be in the left lateral position and then redo the CTG. And of course, pathological CTG, you say whenever there is at least one red feature or two amber features. Now, this is something which you have to be really uh, quick about to understand exclude whether there is any cord prolapse happening, abruption or uterine rupture. And uh, if there is any possible cause which you think is leading to it, you can easily correct it, which is called as intrauterine resuscitation, but also prepare at the same time for urgent delivery. Um, certain conditions like acute bradycardia or when there is a prolonged deceleration for three minutes or more, then again, you have to expedite the birth. Now, uh, also remember that this is a very uh, easy table to remember. Uh, it's again the same which we have just talked. And it, it is uh, again given by the NICE guideline 22. And very, very easy and very, very clear to understand. Baseline rate we have just memorized. Um, the, the variability, remember, if it is more than 5, it is normal. And however, if it is less than 5 beats lasting for 40 minutes, then, of course, it becomes suspicious. However, if it is less than five and lasting for more than 90 minutes, because here you're going to take into account the fetal sleep cycle. But if it is there for more than 90 minutes, it becomes abnormal. Decelerations, earlier variable, then you say that they can be suspicious. Again, here they've written atypical, but we don't use this term at all. And prolonged deceleration for more than three minutes is abnormal. Okay, uh, accelerations, if they're present, they're good. If they're absent, it doesn't matter. So uh, this is again the same thing that remember that you have to, in normal, that means everything is fine, suspicious, identify the cause and move on. 
and pathological, see if there is a cause which can be corrected. Otherwise, plan for urgent delivery. ACOG guideline uh, categorizes CTG. What I was just talking right now was NICE. 2017 amended to 2022. ACOG says still says category 1, category 2 and category 3. Now it's easy to remember this also. Category 1 is same as the normal one. Category 3 is same as the pathological one. And category 2 is like a dumping category where anything which does not fit into category 1 or category 3 becomes category 2. And uh, so the, the rest of the things are similar. Now here, it is again the same that if it is category one, just continue category two, continue the uh, surveillance and do the intrauterine measures in category three, resuscitate the fetus and prepare for delivery. Similar tables in all the three guidelines, I've put them up here so that you know that they are not much different from each other. Now I come to the pitfalls in cardiotocography because a lot of times we make mistakes when we are interpreting. So remember that a fetus can be sleeping. Please don't be in a hurry to do the CTG and uh, don't be very quick to interpret it because that's what we do in our busy labor, loom, labor rooms. Maybe just take a CTG for 10 minutes and then we start texting each other and uh, trying to understand what has to be done. Uh, fetal heart rate should be monitored for at least 40 minutes if there's something going wrong. And you should also try and stimulate the baby. Uh, diagnostic value of NST before 32 weeks varies. But of course, if you have to do in a high-risk mother, then 10 beats and 10 seconds is the criteria. Interpretation should be done very carefully because otherwise it leads to a very large increase in the cesarean rates. A um, lot of drugs which we give sometimes have a lot of effect on the CTG. So remember that also. Falsely reactive NSTs also happen in asymmetric FGRs, oligoamnios because of cord compressions. So try and you know, do an intrauterine resuscitation before you jump to expediting the delivery. So sometimes when you are applying a TOCO, if you have applied very, uh, you know, uh, tightly, then again, it leads to wrong um, uterine contraction monitoring. Sometimes when the women is very obese, then it can be uh, difficult to get the TOCO probe on. Uh, sometimes uh, what happens is the fetal heart rate uh, Probe also picks up the maternal heart rate. In twins also, it's very challenging. And with the medical legal things and everything, it is important that we keep the CTG records uh, for storage. Now, the CTG papers, they usually have a thermal print on it. So if there is anything potential litigant, we should take a photocopy of it and attach it in the file so that even if because the thermal print goes away, but however, the Xerox copy will always stay. Now, uh, before we end, there are two complex presentations of CTG, which I would like to tell. One is saltatory pattern and sinusoidal pattern. Saltatory pattern is a pattern where you have a very high variability, more than 25, and it's lasting for at least 30 minutes. Now, this is also happening whenever there is a rapidly developing hypoxia, uterine hypertonus, and um, the repeated hypoxic insult is happening, especially in second stage. As you can see the CTG here, there's completely no baseline. The fetal heart is going up, down, up, down, up, down. And you can't even make out what is happening. So this is again indicative of acute fetal hypoxia. Similarly, sinusoidal pattern. Sinusoidal pattern is a stable baseline. However, there is no variability. And this happens because of, we know, an RH disease where the fetus is immunized, uh, where the mother is isoimmunized and the fetus has anemia, sometimes abruption and... Um, so this is how the sinusoidal pattern looks like, which is like a zigzag pattern. Remember, there is loss of variability here. So this is what the sinusoidal pattern is. Uh, there is something called a pseudo sinusoidal pattern also, which looks like a sinusoidal pattern, but it is actually not. Its duration is less than 30 minutes. And if you see carefully, actually there is variability here. So this is wrongly interpreted as sinusoidal. It is pseudo sinusoidal pattern. Now, just last two minutes of advanced methods for postgraduates because they should know when they're taking up the exam what are the new methods which are coming. We know it is continuous CTG. But remember, continuous CTG does not give you any positive results in low-risk women. It only increases the cesarean delivery rate. So you should know which women to apply continuous CTG and where you should not. The good thing about computerized CTG is that, sorry, one is continuous CTG. Now we have computerized CTG. So computerized CTG is that you don't have to do any, any interpretation yourself with the AI and everything coming on. 
I'm sure that we will also have machines which will tell you like it is wrong, it is it is red or it is amber or if it is white. And this is a method of doing it. There is a short term variation of fetal heart rate, which the machine can calculate, which you can't see by your naked eye. And if the STV is low, which is less than three milliseconds, then you know that the fetus is hypoxic. So there are studies which have been done using this computerized CTG and they have found that there is a significant reduction of HIE. Next is fetal ECG. Maybe there'll be a time when we will be actually putting in a probe uh, on the fetal scalp and also recording the fetal ECG. The, the, the concept behind it is that the myocardium of the fetal heart is always protected till the very last. So if there is a fetal ECG change, so that means fetus is definitely hypoxic. This last thing is about STAN, um, where uh, you uh, measure the ST segment, ST and T wave in the fetal ECG, and that is how you determine whether the fetus is hypoxic or not. So it make, basically takes into account the ST segment, T wave, and TQRS ratio. I'm very sure in the next few more years to come with AI and all everything coming into medicine, we will soon have all these things telling us what, what is normal and what is abnormal. So all these are stand again used by the computer. So uh, to conclude, remember that interpretation of CTG is extremely important and keep it as normal, suspicious, or pathological. Try taking simple measures like you want to change the fetal maternal position to left lateral, hydrate her if you think that the perfusion is a problem. Stop oxytocin infusion, maybe she's having hyperstimulation. Give her acute tocolysis if you think that it's because of uterine hypertonus. Consider immediate delivery if there is prolonged deceleration or cord prolapse, placental abruption, etc. Um, so also uh, give antipyretics. These are also an important intervention because if she's having, if she's hypothermic, she's bound to have fetal tachycardia. Um, so instrumental delivery can also be done if the cervix is fully dilated. And of course, is there in section if you think that the patient cannot deliver vaginally? Thank you so much. It was really wonderful, uh, this thing. Very nice, very nice talk. Thank you, ma'am. Chairpersons, please. Chairpersons. Uh, thank you, Swati ma'am. Can I talk now? Am I audible? Sure, yes. sure. Actually, I'm on the doors. So there must be some disturbance around, but I'm very sorry for that. Uh, thank you, Swati ma'am. It was really a very elaborate talk on CTG. And I would like to tell the postgraduates that CTG is a very easy, simple, yet important tool in this era of Dopplers, but still CT has a big role to play. And the most important thing is that Dopplers are more subjective. And I think CT is an objective way of evaluating the fetus. More important than this is to have a proper interpretation of CTG. So if you interpret CTG properly, it will give a lot of whole insight into the fetal well-being. So really thank you, Suti ma'am. You've covered the topic right from A to Z, all the points. And even the newer pneumonians like Dr. Brevet and all, I think they should know and interpret. So if they will have a common way of interpreting all the CTGs, so that will help in the diagnosis and also you'll have a uniform management of doing it. So really, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. With the AI coming in, I'm very sure that this talk is going to become redundant in a very few in, uh, in the coming years. No, ma'am. Finally, AI is also run by humans. <laughs> so unless we put in properly, it won't give proper results. Yes. Yeah, really amazing talk by everyone. All chairpersons are really wonderful. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, sir, please. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Thank you, Smriti, ma'am. Thank you, Saili, ma'am. Thank you, Ajit, sir. Thank you for this wonderful session. I would like to thank Dr. Shushma Deshmukh, our president of NOX. I would like to thank the case presenter, Dr. Vaishnavi Nikam, Dr. Pajmala Samanth, ma'am, and Dr. Kanchan Vidbute, ma'am, our examiners for pre-time table. Hello, Tina. Welcome, ma'am. Yes, I Dr. Pragati is here. Hello, ma'am. I would like to hand over hey, Dr. Dr. Pragati, ma'am. Uh, Smriti giving such a nice lecture. It was really excellent. So, I really... I think I should do my duty, though I joined later, I just rushed from the OT. So, first of all, I really uh, apologize because I was late to come to the session. And in this uh, era of Tirgur Sankrant everywhere and uh, 
glory and all i wish you all a very happy and colorful year coming ahead i am thankful that today with pdmc nagpur obgy can do its 18th pg star series on preterm birth and it was it would have been excellent session i'm thankful to today's examiner dr badmaja samal and uh, dr kanchan vidmate thank you so much presenter dr vaishnavi nikam thank you for presenting interesting case at this uh, pg star series today's speaker dr smriti agrawal has done wonderful job and she has detailed each and everything about ctg thank you so much today's chairperson dr ish pandey dr saili jagirdar thank you for sharing the session and being with us and dr tina pramanik as a name uh, you have been a good moc you have been handling the case in my you know so well and last but not the least our dr prachi dikshit dr bhakti gujar and dr anisha balrao they have taken such a wonderful task on them and this is a beautiful program of spreading knowledge spreading light all over the you know all over india all over the globe so we are thankful to them for conducting this program so you know flawlessly throughout the year thank you thank you so much last but not the least all the delegates who have logged in thank you so much and our partners corona thank you thank you all then vaishnavi also presented very well okay yeah. i just missed a case and good as you thank you ma'am yes yes thank you so much thank you so much ma'am <laughs> It was, it, was really great, it was a great it was a great opportunity me it was a very great opportunity to present in front of all the seniors but this is I, a good i wish to improve on some part so attend it such a good experience and even for all of us we have learned so much through this yeah, really we are also learning we are learning so much you know the smriti dr smriti really so, given a wonderful talk really so many new things to learn major series not only pgs practitioners are also learning out of yes so no, and i really salute your enthusiasm dr sushma that aap itne acche se sab cheeze karte rehte ho i don't know from where you get this zeal and energy i try to well because you friends are there na to support me wonderful always always thank you so much can i leave now yeah thanks thank you chalo bye 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 happy makar sankranti to all the happy happy, happy saili makar sankranti ma'am <laughs> oh thank you sa saili kuthe salli mantla kuthe stay madam i am a function chalu hai amadhauti la sodai la alerte muli la acha acha okay okay starting from tomorrow the next three days are all dances kids and all acha amrauti is very vibrant society always <laughs> taking prize at uh, aic og mm. and all your team in the inauguration okay. program, uh, installation program where they are waiting for their prizes <laughs> no no i am a function then amravati i am a function so we need to go to lagot sir okay ha but that is also a big event lagot yes yes thank you ma'am thank you yes. for giving opportunity to be here it's our pleasure please okay. show your face at least i couldn't hear you speaking yes <laughs> yes ma'am I I'm actually the video the video of this laptop. Yes, Vishnu, you put on your video, dear. Yes, ma'am. But the video is not getting any. We're trying from long, ma'am. Acha. That is why he would he would have left to be on screen, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Chalo, send your picture in the group again, please, hai na? Yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> that will work. Chalo, Thank you. Like Have a good day, ma'am. Yes, sir.